Today, I'm going to show you another inkjet printer-friendly alternative for homebrew PCB fabrication. It's the dry foam PCB method. It's cheaper than the presensitized PCBs and does not require an expensive laser printer used for the toner transfer method. If you may have noticed, I've started a video series on the different PCB fabrication methods. My favorite was the presensitized method where you use a special PCB to get really good results. It's a bit expensive so we're going to do a cheaper version of it by making that special PCB at home. Discounted links of the materials can be found below. Let's start the project by grabbing a bare copper clad. I got this locally from a surplus retailer for around $2. It was oxidized and is in bad condition, so I grab a coarse and fine grit sandpaper to clean the board. Don't overdo it as you would make the copper layer a lot thinner. Use some alcohol and a piece of cloth to remove the residual particles. And now you have a clean copper clad. Before you start printing your PCB layout, I would have to inform you that the dry film method uses a slightly different layout. On the right is what we are accustomed to using for the toner transfer method and the presensitized fabrication method. On the dry film, you need to have the color inverted PCB printout. You can achieve that by editing your PDF files on Photoshop or simply exporting your PCB artwork as PDF negative straight from your PCB design software, a feature available for Eagle, Proteus, KiCad, and Altrim. After opening the PDF, click on Print, go to the Properties, select your paper, and set your print quality to high. This method works for inkjet printers and regular paper. Once done, grab a cutting board and a cutter, then cut your layout along its borders. For phenolic-based PCB boards, you can cut the board by scoring it using the blunt edge of your cutter. Score it for around 20 times and place your PCB at the edge of your table. Use a book and press it against the table and carefully snap it. For FR4 fiberglass PCBs, you can use a hacksaw or some shears to cut it. Grab a cutting board and your dry film roll and cut a piece enough to cover your PCB footprint. Just like a camera film, do this in a dim environment as the dry film is sensitive to light. And now you have a raw PCB, the dry film, and your layout. Grab two strips of tape and tape one of the edges back to back. This is the easiest technique for peeling one of the protective films. It's kind of tricky at first, but you'll get a hang of it. It's like a sticker. Face the sticky tinted side on the copper layer of the board, then remove the remaining piece of tape. This is inevitable. Bubbles would have to be removed using an iron, otherwise it would significantly affect your final results. The lamination process has a significant impact to your PCB quality, and later you'll see why I hate the iron. A laminating machine on the other hand does a perfect job compared to the common iron. If you didn't print on a transparency sheet, you would have to apply baby oil on your board to make your paper translucent. For the photo exposure process, you can expose your board using a CFL or LED lamp for around 12 minutes. In my case, my DIY UV exposure box can do it in 7 minutes. A few inches later, you will know that you've exposed it right when the lines reflect on the photo exposed PCB. And like what I said before, the iron isn't perfect. You could still see some bubbles and later you'll see how it affects your PCB quality. Before developing, don't forget to peel the remaining protective film. Once done, we can move on to the photo developing. You'll need to grab a tiny cup of sodium hydroxide, also known as lye or caustic soda. Be sure to wear gloves as this thing could slowly burn your skin. Mix this amount of lye to a liter of water. Then pour your solution on a rectangular container. Drop your photo exposed PCB and carefully agitate the tray. The light exposed areas would start to show up as line masks. The ones that were covered from the light by the ink would eventually dissolve with the solution. Be sure to rinse the board to prevent the residual solution from dissolving the remaining lines. This is the only con of the dry fill method. If you're not going to use a laminating machine and use an iron instead, removing the bubbles would be a lot trickier. As a result, areas of the film failed to stick to the board and resulted to imperfections. If you encounter having these spots, use a marker to retouch them. It all boils down to the work you put on the lamination and photo exposure process. When you're done, you can grab your etching solution. I'm using ferric chloride, the most common PCB etchant. Place your board in the etchant and agitate the tray for around 10 to 15 minutes until the unmasked lines are dissolved. I don't have the patience for that so I made a do-it-yourself etching machine. Feel free to check out my tutorial about it. A few inches later. When you're done, remove the board from the etching solution and rinse it carefully with water. There are two ways of removing the remaining paint. You can use a sheet of sandpaper but I prefer to use pure acetone as it wouldn't make my lines any thinner. Unlike presensitized boards, a cloth with pure acetone isn't enough for removing paint on this one. You will have to use a toothbrush as well. Overall, the dry film method requires a lot of practice. 
Unlike my previous presensitized PCB tutorial, I wouldn't recommend this one for thin-lined SMT boards, not unless you can master the lamination process. But for those who are just building regular boards for THD components that does not require extremely thin lines, the dry foam method is a nifty alternative from the toner transfer method. It has a lot of potential if done properly. I would have to be honest, my attempt on this one was pretty poor, so feel free to comment and share your tricks on dry foam PCB fabrication. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching. Let's start the project by grabbing a bare copper clad. 